You're listening to episode 92 of Lifestyle Locker Radio with Dr. Michael Bruce. We really start to notice that sleep problems start to propagate around the time that Edison invented the light bulb, um, which is kind of interesting. Like you think, well, that was like a great moment in history. Not for sleep, it wasn't. Hi, I'm Dr. Josh Hand, and welcome to the Lifestyle Locker Radio, where we dive into what makes an awesome lifestyle. From relationships to money mindset, nutrition to fitness, emotional health to peak performance, we bring you on an amazing journey to unleashing your human potential. So here's a little bit about our distinguished guest today. This is a little bit of a long bio, but you're going to understand why in just one second. So Dr. Michael Bruce is known as the sleep doctor. He is a clinical psychologist and both a diplomat in the American Board of Sleep Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. He was one of the youngest people to have passed the board at age 31 and with a specialty in sleep disorders is one of only, get this, 168 psychologists in the world with his credentials and distinction. Dr. Bruce is on the clinical advisory board of the Dr. Oz Show and is a regular contributor on the show. He's been on there 35 plus times. It's amazing. Dr. Bruce is the author of The Power of When, which came out in 2016. This is his third book, which is a groundbreaking biohacking book. Way cool, right? Proving that there is a perfect time to do everything based on your hidden biological chronotype. We actually get into that in the show. Dr. Bruce gives the reader the exact perfect time to have sex, run a mile, eat a cheeseburger, ask your boss for a raise, and much more. His second book, The Sleep Doctor's Diet Plan, Lose Weight Through Better Sleep, uh, discusses the science of relationship between quality sleep and metabolism. And his first book, which is called Good Night, The Sleep Doctor's Four-Week Program to Better Sleep and Better Health, which became an Amazon Top 100 bestseller, has been met with rave reviews and contributes to the change the lives of readers all the time. Dr. Bruce is also the chair of the Sleep Technology Section and their first ambassador at Health 2.0, which is a cutting edge health technology conference, right? This guy is everywhere. I don't know how he has the time to do this, right? The sleep doctor. So Dr. Bruce has supplied his expertise with both counseling and as a sleep educator, like a spokesperson, right? To brands such as Princess Cruise Lines, Six Sense Hotel and Spa, Lighting Science Group, Breathe Right, Crown Plaza Hotels, and many, many more. For over 14 years, Dr. Bruce has served as a sleep expert for WebMD. He also writes for the Insomnia blog and can be found regularly on the Huffington Post, Psychology Today, Share Care, and the Oz blog. Dr. Bruce has provided editorial services for numerous medical and psychological peer-reviewed journals and has given hundreds of presentations to professionals and the general public. He has published original research and worked on grant-funded projects and clinical trials. Among his numerous media appearances, Dr. Bruce has been interviewed, get this, this is crazy, on CNN, Oprah, The View, Anderson Cooper, Rachel Ray, Fox and Friends, The Doctors, Joy Behar, The CBS Early Show, The Today Show with Kelly and Michael, and now Lifestyle Locker Radio Podcast. He is an expert resource for most major publications, doing more than 100 interviews per year. I'm glad I was able to get one of these 100. This is amazing. So like Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, the, and, you know, and other really popular magazines. He also appears regularly on Dr. Oz and Sirius XM Radio. So without further ado, here's our man, Dr. Michael Bruce. Okay, everyone in the locker room today, we've got Dr. Bruce. This guy is a sleep doctor. This guy is super smart. I've been diving into some of this content very recently because this is a new topic for me. Um, so I'm super glad to have you here. Well, thanks for having me, dude. I'm excited to be here. And uh, I think the Lifestyle Locker, I love the name and I love thinking about like different ways to really increase our human potential. So I'm excited to be here and uh, looking forward to talking. Awesome. Awesome. Me too. So, you know, sleep, like I said, is it, it, to me, it's an interesting topic. And uh, I, I was talking to my wife, we were driving probably a couple months ago, and I'm like, I, I got to think of new topics. Like, what other things can I put in lifestyle? What do people want? What do people need? 
And she said two things. One was farting and <laughs> was, you know, talking to me. And she goes, what about sleep? I, you know, that's probably an awesome thing because I know when I'm working with entrepreneurs um, and working in, in New York City as well, uh, you know, people live on, on uh, this brown water called coffee 24-7, right. right? You know, and right. Uh, so so that's how we found you. And I, I think it's a neat, neat subject. But tell us your story, how you got so deeply involved. Yeah, so – it wasn't by choice. Um, so here's what happened is uh, I was do, getting my PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Georgia. I am a bulldog. Go dogs. <laughs> um, and um, we had to do our residency. And during the residency, you're allowed to choose your rotations that you want to be involved with. And um, during my residency, um, there was really uh, – there was a six-month rotation. You could do a three-month or a six-month rotation to specialize if you wanted to. And um, nobody took the sleep rotation. And it was right there available on the first thing. And I thought to myself, this sounds cool. I mean, I like to sleep. I sleep reasonably well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff that goes on in the dream world and the sleep world. And I don't know. I guess I'll try it out. By the third day, I had absolutely fallen in love with clinical sleep medicine. And I knew this was where I wanted my career to be. Man, I, I help people that fast. Like literally in 24 hours, there are times where I can, I can change a person's life. And that's the thing that's so cool about sleep is, you know, literally it affects every organ system and every disease state. I mean, everything you do, you do better with a good night's sleep. And so it was just kind of a cool spot to be in. I mean, as a, you know, clinical psychologist, sometimes it can take weeks, months, even years to see treatment gains and somebody's got depression or anxiety mm. or something like that. Whereas with sleep, it's quick, it works, um, and uh, when you change somebody's sleep, you change their life. That's pretty. I mean, that's pretty cool, and I, it's so true. I, I I know the days that I have a really bad sleep. You know, it's right. kind of like stubbing your toe in the morning, and then every everything follows, <laughs> right? It's exactly. Like, wow, it's crazy. Okay, so you kind of get into sleep, you start studying more about sleep, um, and you know, I was listening to an audio clip of of uh, one of your books. Uh, mm -hmm. Which one was it? The power, the power of when, when? Mm -hmm. which is which was really cool. I'm listening, going like, holy cow! Like, when did this all start? You know, um, I've interviewed EMF people, and I start to hear things about light bulbs and yeah, and, and all this stuff. I'm like, huh, this is interesting. So this is this. Is, I'm kind of going deep into. I didn't even know where I was going in this subject, but so when did when did sleep become a problem for for society? So, I mean, here's the thing is we really start to notice that sleep problems start to propagate around the time that Edison invented the light bulb, um, which is kind of interesting. Like you think, well, that was like a great moment in history. Not for sleep it wasn't because it meant that people could work at night. Remember, historically, we used to be an agrarian society, right? We would till the land, grow the farm, you know, do the stuff during the day, sleep at night, and that was kind of how things happened. As soon as a light bulb came around, all of a sudden everything got wonky and the Industrial Revolution really kind of kicked into gear there. And that's when we started to see people using less time for sleep and more time for work. I think the second big thing that happened was the advent of, um, of uh, bonus time, like at work, like uh, time and a half, like overtime. Yeah, yeah. You know, like as soon as people started realizing, wait, I can make time and a half or double my salary by working at hours that nobody else wants to, I'm in. Um, and what they don't realize is, of course, these have tremendous biological consequences over the course of time. I mean, you talk to people who are shift workers, like who work the night shift for 5, 10, 15 years. I mean, they all have autoimmune issues. They all have oh, you know, major fatigue. Um, their bodies don't digest well. A lot of them get to be overweight and obese. I'm not saying everybody that, shift, that has a shift work is like, you know, going downhill, but there is a lot of them that do. We know that the suicide rates are higher for those people. We know the depression rates are higher for those people. So those two things really started to kick things off for sleep. And then I think the third thing, and I, I mean, I hate to be crude about it, but it's the truth. It's just, you know, whenever America started getting so damn fat, that's when we started to see sleep apnea really kick into gear. Okay. Now look, yeah. you don't have to be a bigger person to have sleep apnea, but it definitely makes it a lot worse if you do. Um, now, granted, there are some people who've got really big tonsils, you know, and it's in their throat and blocking their throat and those kind of things. But 
the majority of people that are showing up with sleep apnea these days, they're either pre-diabetic or diabetic for sure. Um, they're either overweight, obese, or morbidly obese. Um, and um, we know that those are direct connections there. And so as, this, as society seems to grow and mature, honestly, we keep inventing new ways to mess up our sleep. Um, the newest one is probably with blue light, right? So you mentioned blue light a minute ago. I mean, when we look at the wavelength of light, which constitutes blue, right? Yeah. So, and by the way, folks, it's not blue, actually. Um, all light has a spectrum. And inside that spectrum, between 450 and 480 nanometers is called the blue light. That light, when it hits a very particular cell in your eye called a melanopsin cell, turns off the melatonin faucet in your head, right? Now remember, you want melatonin going when you sleep, right? Because melatonin is kind of that key that starts the engine for sleep. It's not everything that you need, but you can't sleep without it. And so having blue light at night really suppresses that melatonin, and that's where people are starting to see even bigger sleep problems. It, I, yeah, it's, and I, I don't have them on right now. My screen is, has a blue, you know, like the, right? <laughs> a blue blocker, that, if you will. Blue but filter I normally, across yeah, it. I'm Use normally your blue wearing blockers. glasses uh, when I work with the computer. Um, but my God, when I started doing that and things like putting my phone on airplane mode at nighttime, like right. that, 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 I mean, that was almost an instantaneous, like, <laughs> I know. Holy crap. I just, I mean, I thought I was sleeping pretty good, but that was, that was very different. You know, yes. so I had to do it for, it, you know, I did it for a week. Oh, I'm doing it now for all time. But like after a week, I'm like, holy cow. It, it, it was the blue on my phone. It was the blue yeah. on the computer. And it was definitely that Wi-Fi frequency was totally, totally. screwing with something in my head. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting. So I, have, I now have patients, Josh, that I tell them to turn off the router in their house. Yes. And they sleep better. Yeah. Yeah, I have to I have to figure out to get into mine. I've I've done all the devices and everything around, but I have not done the router yet. That's my next uh, venture in because I've heard that's yeah. awesome. And you can put on a timer from whatever I've from what I've heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it I mean it doesn't mess up your internet and you still get your email and all that kind of stuff. And by the way, who the hell needs email at three o'clock in the morning? Nobody. Exactly. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. So but so this cool. The the book The Power of When you know, yep. I love I love the you know the subtitle, but just like the few the few words like discover your chronotype, and I want you to explain what that is. But the best yep. time to eat, you know, lunch, ask for a raise, have sex, write a novel, all of these things. Um, so, like, how do you come up with all? Like, how do you even come up with this? So this was interesting. So it actually was. Um, so I've written about chronotypes for a long period of time. So I, I, this is my third book. I've been writing books since two thousand four. And in each one of my books, I've talked about when you should do certain things. So as an example, I tell people all the time when they should go to bed, when they should wake up, when they should eat. Um, and it's all based on this idea of circadian rhythms. Now, for folks out there who may or may not know what circadian rhythms are, there's two systems for sleep, okay? There's a sleep drive, and that drive is a lot like hunger, right? So it builds up over the course of the day. So hung I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I eat something, and that hunger begins to dissipate. The same holds true with sleep. Um, there's, a, there's a chemical that's formed, it's a neurochemical called adenosine. So when a cell eats a piece of glucose, something comes out the back end. One of those things is adenosine. It works its way through your system and hits a very specific receptor site in your brain. As it gets more and more, you get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. By the way, just as a little geeky note on the side, if you look at the molecular structure of adenosine and the molecular structure of caffeine, they're off by one molecule. Wow, okay. So that's why caffeine actually helps keep you awake because when it gets in there, it blocks the adenosine from getting into the receptor uh. and making you feel sleepy. So that's one of the reasons why caffeine works. But the second system is more important for what our discussion is, which is your circadian rhythm, your internal biological clock, if you will. And why that's so important is because just like you kind of feel hungry at breakfast time, lunch time, and dinner time, you also need a circadian rhythm to tell your body when to sleep which for most Americans falls in the between the 10 and 11 o'clock kind of time range. So once you start kind of understanding those things, you can make recommendations. And like I said, I've been making recommendations for people about when to do stuff for a very long time. I've actually written over 80 blogs looking at circadian rhythms and what's called chronobiology. So let's unpack that for a second, right? What is a chronotype? What is chronobiology? Yeah. What is a chronorhythm, right? So a circadian rhythm and a chronorhythm are very similar, except that a chronorhythm is specific for a type of person. So uh, then you're going to say, type of person. Well, 
Aren't we all kind of the same? No, we're not. So if anybody out there has ever been called an early bird or a night owl, those are chronotypes, right? It turns out that there aren't two, there's four, right? So there's an early one, a middle one, a late one, and then people with insomnia. And this is all, by the way, genetically predetermined, okay? I didn't make this up. This isn't some, you know, wild-ass fantasy, you know, research that somebody did somewhere. People have been documenting this um, genetically for since the 70s, believe okay. it or not. So 50 years this stuff has been going on. Also, by the way, another kind of side geeky fact, this year's Nobel Prize in medicine was given to circadian researchers. Oh, cool. So we're really starting to see this become the bleeding edge, the newest, latest, greatest stuff that's going on in medicine is, is circadian. And um, it was time to write a book about it. And so what I did was I said, okay, well, I know that there are these three different types of chronotypes, right? Early, middle, and late. But what about all my insomnia patients? They don't seem to fall into any of those categories. So I decided to see if genetically it made sense, and of course it does, um, to include them in the category. So then once I said they've, I've got four categories, I had to create an assessment tool or a quiz um, so people could identify them. So that wasn't that hard to do um, because we know there are certain personality characteristics of each of the chronotypes, uh, and I renamed them. Um, because historically we've called things early birds and night owls and well to be honest with you you know I'm a mammal not a bird yeah. um, and I wanted to choose a mammals to represent the different chronotypes <laughs> so I actually chose ones that have this as a as their own circadian rhythm so lions turn out to be my early birds um, and we all know that lions actually have their first kill before dawn like these are active creatures in the very very early morning hours um, the middle characteristic, which we used to call hummingbirds, I call a bear. Um, the reason I call them a bear is because these individuals are right there in the middle. And by the way, it's the best to be a bear. 55% of the population are bears um, because they kind of get up when the sun comes up and they go to bed not too long after the sun goes down. And really society is kind of built on their schedule. Then um, the night owls I changed to wolves um, and I'm a wolf. Um, and I always have been. Um, ever since my teenage years, I've been one of those kids who stayed up late and liked to sleep late. And um, wolves, of course, are very nocturnal creatures. They, you know, they hunt at night. And then I decided to use a dolphin as a uh, as a representative for insomnia. And here's why: if you look at dolphins, they actually sleep unihemispherically. So half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake and looking for predators because they're constantly swimming. Yeah, they're gonna move. And I thought that was kind of a represented you know insomniacs who never quite get to sleep right um and so those are the four characteristics if, if anybody out there is interested you can go to the power of when quiz.com and that'll be in the show notes and all that yeah, good yeah. stuff um and figure out what your chronotype is and then once you know your chronotype here's where it gets really cool right so you figure out you're a lion a bear a wolf or a dolphin but here's where it's interesting is if you're a lion and you wake up at 5 a.m., which a lot of lions do, um, that's when all of your hormones start off, right? Your cortisol is up, your uh, adrenaline is up, um, melatonin is down, and you kind of start your day. But if you're a wolf like me and you don't wake up until 8 o'clock, all of those hormones are shifted by two or three hours because you don't wake up until then. So here's where it gets interesting. So then what I decided to do is I plotted where the – because remember, hormones, as you know, are super predictable. Right, we know the ebb and the flow of hormones, generally speaking. So then I looked for the ebb and the flow and figured out when certain hormones would be high during periods of day based on your chronotype, and it just became super simple. Right, I can literally tell people the best time of day to have sex, eat a cheeseburger, ask your boss for a raise. I mean, you name it. That's crazy. And can people, you know, over over the course of their life, can they switch from one to the other? So that's where I talk about something that I call chrono longevity. So kids go through each one of the chronotypes before theirs is set. So when you talk about infants, they're more like lions. They're getting up at four o'clock in the morning, they're going to bed at six o'clock at night, right? Um, when they hit the middle school years, they're more like bears. They're going to bed you know, when the sun goes down and waking up when the sun comes up. And then when they become teenagers, they turn into wolves, right? Because they yeah. wanna stay up super late and sleep super late. Once most people hit about 18 to 20 years old, that's when we start to see the chronotype sets in and then it kind of stays 
until you reach about age 55 or 60 when it can change again and then it can go early. So, you know, lots of, you see a lot of uh, older folks going to bed early, waking up early, you know, going to, you know, dinner at 4.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's all because their chronotypes have shifted again. So we see shifting occurring throughout a lifetime. Okay. And, and can you, like, can you train yourself to switch a chronotype or is that? So it's hard because it's genetic, right? Okay. So you have to literally do something every day to keep pushing you backwards. The answer is yes, you can. Um, but it's like constantly putting yourself into a state of jet lag, right? So think about it like this. If you live in California and you fly to New York every single day, you have to make that adjustment, or at least your body does. And yeah. so that's kind of what you would be doing. If you're trying to tell yourself, I don't want to be a wolf anymore, I want to be a lion. It's not impossible. You can use light melatonin and caffeine to do it, but you got to do it every single day. Yeah. And that's not fun. Yeah, you'd have to like try to hack, <laughs> hack life the whole time, which is not the best thing to do. Right, and um, it's just not good for you. Yeah, you know? yeah, oh, yeah. You said it. it's going to affect every single organ system. It's going to affect. It's going to affect you as a human being. You know, your longevity yeah. as a human being is going to tank probably at that point. Well, absolutely. There was actually a study that came out within the last six months that looked at sleep deprivation and cancer cells, and they discovered that the more sleep deprived you are, the faster cancer cells multiply. Cancer. Okay, we're not fucking around here anymore. Yeah, exactly. Like, we're talking about the biggest disease out there, or mm -hmm. certainly one of them, and it's dramatically affected by how you sleep. So, I mean, come on, guys. Like, it's time to figure this out. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and for those listening, I mean, when you affect your sleep, like we said, everything, like your your body's repairing itself in sleep. I mean, that's it needs to do that. <laughs> your immune system gets shot. Healing. You're exactly right. Sleep is a time of healing. And, and, and why would we deprive our body of time to heal? Like, I don't get it. Like I, like, I understand having a busy schedule, and I understand you want to do other things, and you want to play with people, hang out, goof off, blah, 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 work more, spend time with family. I get all that, but at the end of the day, I want my body to heal every single night so that I can do the things I want to do the next day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it, for myself, you know, running a practice and then running, you know, running this this podcast, it's... It's a lot, and I find that when I get to that point, like my body will yell at me one way or another and just say, You're, you don't have a choice. You're going right. to sleep. You're done. You're done. Tap out, you know? Right. Um, and then I just, then I have to like mentally reboot myself. Like, okay, what was I doing wrong? Like, was I drinking too much coffee? Was I, you sure. know, whatever it was? And it's, it's pretty interesting um, because when I, uh, when I moved, back from chiropractic college from Florida to New York, I was used to getting up, we'll say like 7 a.m. for classes or whatever it was. Um, and it stayed l uh, light really long in the summer in Florida. It's like 9, 9, 9.30 at night. So it was cool. Like So we'd have a whole day of outdoor. But when I moved to New York, I was getting up at 5 a.m. to get in the car to drive to the city. So right. like, th I, don't, I, don't, I have to really think now which, which chronotype I am. But my God, like those, those first like three months, yeah, oh, God. It's brutal. Yeah. If you want to figure out what chronotype you are, take the quiz. I'm going to take um, it. It totally is. Yeah. For sure. And, and, and here's what people will find is people will – and it's interesting when people take the quiz because there's only about 15% of people are lions. About 50, 50% are bears. About 15 to 20% are wolves. And then about 10 to 15% are dolphins, which are my problem children or my insomniacs. Yeah. I'm definitely, um, I'm definitely not a dolphin. Yeah, I, that's I, good. I can't say it that thankful, late. Dude. Be thankful. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, wow. So here we go. So so let's get into the the performance game a little bit. I I like to just yep. talk to you because a lot of people listening are have really active lifestyles. Perfect. Um, Me too. I just finished working out for two hours, so oh, I'm awesome. Yeah. Love it. Love it. So how, you know, if, if I have people like myself that I I just did an ultra marathon uh, two weeks ago. I'm planning on doing a couple of these crazy events, endurance events uh, throughout a year, but not full time. You know, how could I use sleep as a performance drug? Sure. Right. So you know, not a drug, but yeah, it is the newest performance drug. So first of all, every single major um, sports team has a sleep doctor either um, consulting with them or as it's uh, on staff. Because, look, they're investing millions of dollars mm. into these guys and gals. They need to make sure that, these, that, that, you know, that machine is tuned and doing well. So you're not alone in your thought process here of making sure that sleep is kind of the next secret weapon. Yeah. It depends on the types of events 
and okay. what it is you're trying to accomplish, right? You know, when you look at an ultra marathon, those are what, like 100 miles? Well, I didn't do that one yet. I did my first. This is my first one. This is a 50K, so 32 miles. So 32 miles, which is a long period of time, right? Yep. So, you know, when you look at, at exercising for that length of time, um, a couple of different things are going to be important. Clearly, your pre-performance sleep is going to be dramatically important, and that's leading up to the event because the easiest way to injure yourself is to be too tired to perform. Oh, okay, totally. and especially when you're doing a lengthy event like an ultra event, because you're doing the same basic, you know, biomechanical movements for extended periods of time, right? And so, even if you, I mean, just to do the math, let's say the 30 miles. Let's say just for argument's sake that you do. Uh, seven minute miles, right? I'd be nice. And nobody's, you know. <laughs> and no, okay, let's make it easier. I did Ten seven, and, I did 13 minute miles. How about that? Okay, fine. So let, well, that math is harder for me right. to do in my, let's do 10 <laughs> minute miles, right? So 10 minute miles, 30 miles, that's 300 minutes, right? Yep. So that's five hours of straight running. If you haven't trained well enough for the weeks before that, for your body to endure that, you're going to have a problem. It's not the it's not the issue of can I stay awake during that period of time. Of course you can. People stay awake for 18, 20, 30, 60 hours, right? But it, it's the performance. It's to be able to, to to hit that level and maintain that. It has to do with metabolism for sure because remember sleep directly affects your metabolism. My second book was called The Sleep Doctor's Diet, Lose Weight Through Better Sleep, and it's all about the metabolic process and sleep and how that works. Because for you, it's all about energy expenditure, right? Yeah. It's all about having enough fuel in the tank and being able to make it as long as you need to make it. And you cannot do that with bad sleep. It just doesn't work. Yeah. So then what about what about like uh, someone that may be like doing sprinting work or someone that's like a huh? CrossFit athlete or a you know, sure. just, I mean, just how about this? Like, I, I today, I don't, I don't run, but I went to the gym. I spent about an hour in the gym today. Mm -hmm. Like, what about that person? The, the, well, the average person that does go to the gym. So here's what we know: is there's a couple of different sides to this equation, right? So first of all, the more sleep deprived you become, the worse your performance is across the board. Doesn't matter the sport. Doesn't matter how much time you spend. Doesn't matter, right? And so a couple things to think about. So with a level of sleep deprivation, which by the way is different for each person, right? So I sleep six and a half hours a night. You might sleep eight hours a night. If you slept six and a half, you'd be sleep deprived, but I'd be on par. So just to kind of keep people in line, okay. figuring out how much sleep you need is very, very critical. But if you don't get that amount of sleep, here's what we know. Testosterone dumps for guys. I mean dumps. We, uh, there was a great test where they looked at a 22-year-old um, after 36 hours of sleep deprivation, and they had the testosterone levels of a 36-year-old. Okay. 12 yes. year they just, they just aged 12 years, yeah. Like, that's insane. When we look at reaction time, same same kind of group, uh, group work, what we see is reaction time dumps by a third. You're a third slower yeah. uh, as, wow. as you get more, more sleep deprived. A wow. third. A 33%, I mean, that's insane. Yeah, I mean, like when you think through these ideas, I, here's what I can tell you because I've worked with Olympic athletes before. If you want to be on the podium, you better be sleeping well. Um, and, and again, it's going to be different for different people. Travel also turns out to be a big factor for a lot of my athletes because you got to go to a race or you got to go to a game or whatever. And you're sleeping in a new environment and then there's jet lag. Like there's a lot of factors in there. But just for the average individual, if you want to sleep better, exercise. And if you want to exercise better, sleep. Okay. So it is a two-way street and it works that way very well. The single best way to improve the quality of your sleep is through exercise, daily exercise. I'm not talking about running an ultra marathon here, but look, if you can do 20 to 30 minutes doctor approved exercise, you will see gains in your overall sleep, specifically in stages three and four sleep, which is the physically restorative sleep. And that's really where you get the good stuff because that's where growth hormone is emitted and you get cellular repair and all the things that you're looking for. So that helps you avoid injury, right? That's another big factor for all the act active athletes that are listening to your podcast is if you really want to lower your injury, sleep helps a lot. Okay, awesome. So here's another question. Um, yep. I'm thinking of myself. There are days where I feel I can just go to sleep and I don't know how long it takes. I never really look at a clock. Yeah. Um, but there are certain days that I can, I'll just lay down and I'll be like, crap, mm -hmm. you know, like what the hell I want to go to sleep. I got to be up in like six hours or five hours or whatever it is. 
So the question is what to do or yeah, what is what, what to do? At, well, both. What is it? I'm sure it's my head it's just so, going like in well, a million directions, but yeah. So part the of number it. one complaint that I hear is I can't turn off my brain. Okay. So, and that's kind of what you're describing a little yeah. bit there. Yeah, totally. Is people say that, you know, they lie in bed and, and by the way, it makes sense. Okay. So think about it. People have been chatting in your ear all day. You've been dealing with patients, dealing with, you know, a partner or, or you know, or loved one or kids or whatever. And people are talking to you, asking you questions, doing podcasts, whatever. When you finally get in bed and I can turn off the light, it's the first time nobody's talking to you. Nobody's asking you to do something. No, you're not preoccupied with something. So all the thoughts from the day, of course, they come flooding in and you got to figure out how to make sense of them. Oh, shit. Did I pick up my dry cleaning or gosh, I ate too much at dinner or wow, I didn't really you know, do as well in my workout as I wanted to. All of those things are going to come flooding in. So the first thing I have a lot of people do who have this as an issue um, is I have them create what I call a worry journal. So about three or four hours before bed, not right before bed, but a few hours before bed, just start writing down all the stuff that was going on with you during the day and one solution for each thing. Now that solution might be I'm going to call so-and-so, I'm going to email somebody, or it might be just lock that in my mind because that's a piece of information I need for later. But just doing like a download several hours before bed, getting it out and then kind of closing that book is super duper helpful because it can also help you make your list for the next day of kind of things that you want to do that tonight goal setting and things like that yeah. it's super duper helpful but right before bed my favorite thing to get people to do is to actually uh, generate in their head a gratitude list so like what am i grateful for am i is it my health is it my family is it my dog is it my money is it whatever it is because there's actually data to show that if you think about something positive before bed, it can actually have a positive influence on your dreams and make you fall asleep quicker. Sweet. So get the get all the other stuff out earlier in the night and then just do this right before bed. Um, and remember, sleep is not an on-off switch, all right? It's like slowly pulling your foot off the gas and slowly putting your foot on the brake. There's a process that needs to occur. It should take most people 20 to 25 minutes to fall asleep. Okay. If you fall asleep in under five minutes, that actually isn't a great sign. That could mean that you're sleep deprived. Oh, okay. So, you're not sleeping, you're maybe not sleeping through the night at all, period. Exactly, uh, right? Or you're not getting enough sleep or something like that. So you really need to think through those okay. kind of ideas. And I will tell you the single best way to have a good night's sleep is to have a regular wake up time. Notice I didn't say bedtime, but wake up time. And I mean during the week and on the weekends, same time. Right. Okay. So, so here's why. Because remember that circadian rhythm that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. If you sleep in for more than a half an hour, the whole thing shifts, and you just create a jet lag for your brain. Okay. So think about it like this: I stay up on Friday, sleep in on Saturday. Stay up on Saturday, sleep in on Sunday. What do you think your brain wants to do Sunday night? Same exact thing. Same exact thing. Right. That's why we call it Sunday night insomnia. But if you woke up at the same time, even if you didn't go to bed until 2 a.m. and your wake up time is 6.30, get up at 6.30, yeah, I know that sucks, but take a nap, okay? There's nothing wrong with taking a 25 minute power nap during the day. Don't go over because if you sleep more than 25 minutes, you're gonna wake up and feel like crap. Um, I don't know if anybody out there has had that experience. I certainly have. Yeah, yeah, totally. Over 25 minutes, you get into deep sleep and it sucks, or do a full 90 minute sleep cycle. Right, average sleep cycles run about 90 minutes. So if you've got the time on Saturday afternoon to sleep for 90 minutes, go for it. But generally speaking, wake up at the same time. If you got to take a nap, take a nap. And there's one caveat here, which is anybody who is an insomniac or a dolphin on my scale, don't nap because it screws you up for the whole day. Oh, interesting, huh? That's real. That's that's. I'm gonna take. I mean, I love the gratitude. I usually do that in the morning, but I may have to do it again at night. Uh, yeah, but that that worry journal is really neat. I, I like the the download. That just, I mean, that makes total sense. Was that's usually what I think is in, for me is going mm -hmm. through my head. It's like, okay, what the hell did I do? And yeah, you, you just got to get out. Yeah, it's that's that's so good. So let, let's let's turn uh, or shift gears here, if you will. Let's get uh -huh. into like the the food, you know, sure. you know, in sleep, like throughout the day. I mean, I know we're all humans and we all eat. Unfortunately, there's a lot of bad crap, that, <laughs> especially in the right. U.S. Um, yeah, sure. but, uh, what foods are like, like awesome to help you 
you know, get good night's sleep. Like if is it your is it early food in the more in the in like your morning if you're or your evening. So food it's gonna or... depend. It's gonna depend on your chronotype, right? So okay. if you're an early bird, like a lion chronotype, then you're gonna have a fairly different meal schedule and uh, in some cases meal content versus a night owl. Um, so I'll tell you about historically what's been for a wolf, which is me, a night person. Um, we're the worst eaters in the universe. We eat very late and we eat a lot of crap. Um, and, and historically that means that a lot of us have a tendency to gain weight, um, be sicker, um, have more mental health issues and things like that. Whereas if you're a lion or an early morning person, you have a tendency to be more health conscious. Um, you have a tendency to eat better foods, cleaner foods, um, and are smarter about doing it in the mornings. Now, Food is really interesting to me because I, I believe that food um, is medicine just as, as much as light is medicine, just as much as sleep is medicine, right? All of these things affect our bodies, and we have to keep that in mind when we're kind of thinking through our overall regimen. Um, but there was a really interesting study done, and it's actually in The Power of When, looking at when to eat. So they took uh, genetically identical mice, right? So, because, um, you know, they do a lot of mice studies, and um, they put them in three different cages. One cage of mice had free running food. So they had a dish of food, they could eat as much of it as they want and it, within the 24 hour period. The middle group could only have access to the food for 12 hours. Same caloric content, same amount of food. The other group could only have it access to it for eight hours, all right? The free running group gained weight, the 12 hour group main, maintained stability, the eight hour group lost weight, same food genetically identical rodents, mm. okay? So what does that tell us? It tells us that timing matters, right? And we should keep our food ingestion into a smaller zone um, because that's what our body is built to handle. Our bodies weren't built to handle snacking at two o'clock in the morning if you've been eating since six o'clock in the morning, right? Yeah. Body's just built that way. So we really need to think this whole idea about when to eat I think becomes critically important in a lot of people. And then if you can base it on your chronotype, you're in great shape because your body's metabolism is working with you uh, and it helps out quite a bit. Oh, that's cool. I mean, that's, and, I, and I'm not sure if you use it in the book, but intermittent fasting is that the, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I've, that's been a, such a great conversation with a lot of people and all different, uh, you know, lines of lifestyle work that I, that I talk yeah. about. And I said that conversation about an hour ago with a patient about, you know, that wants right. to lose weight. I'm like, cut your window down to eight hours. That's the first step. She goes, really? Easily. Really? I go, yeah. I go, well, you want to do it in the morning, you want to do it in the evening. Just pick an eight-hour window and then stop right. after. Right. And, uh, and that's what I tell people all the time. And, uh, and it's so fascinating because nobody's ever even thought of the concept. And as soon as you think, as soon as you really start to think about it, you're like, oh, okay, so my metabolism will be working on, like if I'm only eating during an eight-hour window, that gives my metabolism a whole lot more time to work through the calories and work through the fuel. Yeah. So, so it, it makes a lot of sense. Then we change what they're eating and it gets even better. Yeah, that's pretty neat. Um, what else? This is this is pretty cool. I'm, I'm thinking for myself here because <laughs> my my sleep patterns, I don't travel a ton, but I do travel and I'm thinking about, you know, listening to you talk about time zone shift. Um, and you said, I think, here heard you say in the audio book that for every time zone it takes a day Correct. to recover so like if i'm going i'm going to british columbia for three days huh. from new york okay so that's a three hour time difference right three hour time uh yeah i think it's three right so and east remember east is least and west is best so when you're traveling from new york to bc that's going to be good because all you're doing is asking your body to stay up later yeah right so what time do you normally go to bed uh, I'm like a 10, 10 30 person maybe. Right. So when you, so 10 30 New York time is really 7 30 California or British Columbia time. And you're not going to bed at 7 30. You'll probably go to bed at 9 30. So yeah. you could probably stay up until 12 30 and be just fine. It's really a pain in the ass when you go the opposite direction. Oh, totally. Uh, which is what I do constantly because I live in Los Angeles and I do a tremendous amount of uh, work in New York. So I'm back and forth, you know, taking that plane constantly. And, um, you know, if I've got a, if I've got a meeting at 7 a.m. New York time, that's 4 a.m. my body clock time. But, you know, my yeah. clients and they don't care. They yeah. want the 7 a.m. meeting. So I use light therapy and melatonin to help adjust my schedule faster 
uh, and then I can be on point no matter what. Okay, okay. So that's that's kind of the you know for that type of situation, that's a it's a good yep. okay that light there perfect. So I've been looking yep. into that because if this, these type of trips start to become more frequent, yes, that I I just don't want to be shot for a week. You know, it's, yeah. So, and you won't be, especially if you use. So what I tell people is use light like you would use a cup of coffee, right? So if normally you would wake up in the morning and have a cup of coffee. If you've traveled multiple time zones. Get outside and get some sunlight or bring a light box. Like I have – and they're commercially available. You can get them on Amazon for less than 100 bucks. Um, I keep one in my suitcase and I take it with me everywhere and I love it. Okay. Um, now, I do a tremendous amount of international travel as well. But once I get to my destination, I wake up at the destination time that I want to be up and I have light therapy for a good 20 minutes when I wake up. And I might even do it once or twice during the day and it keeps me awake. Uh, and then at night – I use a half a milligram of melatonin, a half a milligram, people. 95% of the melatonin is sold in an overdosage format. It's sold in three, five, and 10 milligrams, which is not appropriate. So if you can find a half, go for it. If you can't, go to Trader Joe's. Their um, house brand melatonin is actually a half a milligram. It's the only place I've found it like that. Oh, cool. So, I'll put that in the show notes too. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Check it out. Um, and my favorite light box that's available is called the Go Light, G-O-L-I-T-E. Uh -huh. It's by Philips, and it's awesome. Okay. Uh, they really do a nice job, and it's portable, and you can actually it's actually rechargeable, so you can charge it at home, and then you don't have to worry about bringing cords and all that stuff with you. Oh, cool. that's pretty neat. Wow, okay, cool. This is a good win. I think we're, we're getting a, covering a lot of uh, ground here. Absolutely. Um, so what other, what other kind of neat things that do you think uh, – the audience may want to know about sleep. I, I'm kind of coming like losing questions in oh, my head I, right now. I got all kinds of good stuff for you. So I'll tell you the area that a lot of people have been asking me a lot of questions about these days um, has been cannabis and sleep. Okay. A whole lot of questions about that. Traditional so, like CBD or marijuana? Both. Both. Okay. Uh -huh. So so again, I live in California. Uh, it's recreationally legal here. I mean, there are dispensaries, you know probably within 10 miles of my house where you can walk in legally and purchase as much marijuana as you would like. So I have to become very knowledgeable about how does marijuana affect sleep. Okay. Um, and guess what? There are some marijuanas that are very good for sleep. Um, and people out there are like, what? Absolutely. So like as an example, and, and again, I'm not a marijuana expert. I'm mm -hmm. a sleep expert. But if you look, if you look into cannabis, it's, it's a lot like wine. Okay, so you know how there's red wine and white wine? Yeah, and then 8 well, million actually, different types. <laughs> right, and then, and then there's a million types underneath that. The same holds true with marijuana. There's something called sativa, which mm. is more of an energy promotion, and there's something called indigo, which is more of a relaxation. Clearly, you want to be more on the relaxation side of things, especially if you've got insomnia. Um, and I'll tell you where a lot of this data um, I was learning about it was I have several patients. Um, I've worked with veterans who have PTSD. Um, and literally the only thing I was able to find that could actually get those guys and gals to sleep was indigo cannabis. Uh, and it was very, very effective. Okay. Again, all legally done. If they were in a state where it was, uh, they had to get a card, they would go and get a card, that kind of stuff. But um, very interesting ideas going on there. Also, um, the THC to CBD ratio turns out to be very important. Um, it turns out that like an eight to one um, THC to CBD turns out to be quite good. You want to have some THC in your, uh, in your cannabis because it will help that relaxation process. Um, but what you really want is the CBD, which is all the anti-inflammatory properties. Because um, we know that people with sleep deprivation have high levels of something called C-reactive protein. Um, we know that happens with obstructive sleep apnea. We know what happens with... Um, with uh, sleep deprivation, we know what happens with insomnia. Well, C-reactive protein is a is an inflammatory cytokine. It's not good. It's you don't bad. want high levels of it, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's bad, right? And CBD helps bring it down. So that can be very, very helpful. Now, don't go out and swallow a big bottle of CBD. That's not what I'm talking about. You need to really kind of look at the literature and start to understand what's going on. But there are some uh, really good uh, websites out there and, and pieces of information. Um, if people are super interested in CBD, if you go head on over to my website, which is thesleepdoctor.com, if you click on the blogs um, and you type in CBD, I've written two or three blogs 
explaining dosages and you know interaction effects and things that people need to think about. So definitely check it out. There's a ton of information. That's there. great. I started taking uh, CBDs. I just did a web. I've done a couple webinars for my patients on it, and um, I had a couple of podcasts with some experts on CBDs, and not mm-hmm. not the actual marijuana side, but more the right. the you know the mostly CBD with a very low percentage of THC, where there's no psychotropic effect. Right. And uh, I started taking, I've tried a few, but I started taking a full plant one, which they recommended, which almost looks like something you put in a Vitamix. It's like goo. Right. It's really gross. Right. Um, but taking that, they, I mean, they, he kind of described it as like a nervous system relaxer. And my mm-hmm. sleep shifted within one night. Yeah. Within one night, um, which was really neat. So, yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up because it's a natural, healthy yeah. Totally great way. In New York State, it's a little little elite. Well, CBD is legal, but the other way is, is not legal at the moment. Um, but I think New Jersey, it is right. It's getting. I, I don't know if it passed yet, but it's it's. Yeah. You have to get. Let a me minute. tell you something. Within the next five to seven years, it'll be legal everywhere. The 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 horse has left the barn on that one a long time ago. Yeah, that, exactly. Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, what other are there any other like tips and and tricks that people can use? Um, just like on right for regular sleep, I know we mentioned you know finding out your your chronotype. Yep, so I've got I got one more for everybody okay. that I think you'll we'll find interesting, um, and this is a napping hack. Okay. Okay. So I call it the napa latte. <laughs> okay, right. I was actually think I was going to ask about. It. I think I know what you're saying. I was going to ask about this actually. So this is a technique I use for all my corporate you know CEOs. So if you just didn't get enough sleep four and a half, five hours, and you are dragging it, and you know you've got to really perform, here's what I have people do, is go and get a six to eight ounce cup of drip black coffee. Don't add sugar, don't add creamer. Throw in three ice cubes, all right, to cool it down. Drink the whole thing as quickly as you can, and then immediately take a uh, 25 minute nap, right? So remember when we were talking earlier in the podcast about how adenosine and caffeine are only off by one molecule? Yes. So if you're tired and that adenosine is built up, by taking the nap, you eat through that adenosine, and then by having ingested the caffeine before, it hits those receptor sites and blocks the future adenosine from locking in. You're good for four hours, guaranteed. Uh, that's really cool. Yeah, I've, I've I've actually heard I recently something about like a coffee nap like that. Yep. The, the, what did you call it? The napa latte. I call it the napa latte. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I haven't tried that. I, that's I'm sure Dude, you've got my... to try it. Yeah. You've got to try it. I will. It. I will. I'm into that. I love this stuff. This is so cool. So, yeah, so you got you got me. I think I'm gonna get that. I'm gonna look up that go light. We yep. said is important. We said the the worry journal, the gratitude for for the people that got like crazy minds like mine that what they're running, you know, a million exactly. miles a minute. Um, CBDs, uh, chronotype. Uh, so I think this is pretty good. I think we got a lot of really good stuff here. Good. 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 Yeah. Well. Thanks for having me on the show. You know, I certainly appreciate it. I'm glad we've gotten a chance to talk now, and hopefully, we'll get a chance to do this again sometime. Yeah, um, I definitely think we will. Because I'm gonna def- I'm gonna go through all this stuff. I will test all this stuff for myself anyway, and, and probably yeah. have another conversation with you. See, absolutely, try it all, and then have me back, and let's see what happens. Yeah, totally. All right, Michael, this was rocking, dude. I really appreciate. It. I'm glad we connected, and yeah. uh, we'll stay tuned for the next one. Absolutely. Locker Nation, wow. Hope you did not sleep through that episode. Dr. Michael Bruce dropped some seriously awesome content. And if you want to know a few things you should do, just rewind back about five minutes. You can you should listen to the whole thing again, really. But rewind back about five minutes, and he got a list of really cool things that you can do. Everything from the go light to uh, the, the Napa latte, right? The coffee nap. So you can get actually extra four hours of, of energy and focus and work after, like CEO type of nap. So see where you can apply better sleeping habits to yourself. All the details, all the content will be in the show notes. So make sure you do check that out. And also, if you've liked this episode, you got to do two things. One, share it with someone you care about and you think will actually benefit from it. And two, wherever you're listening, I like iTunes, but wherever you're listening, give us a five-star review. It will help us out greatly. More people need to hear this free content. And I know, hopefully, you are enjoying it as well because you have just listened to another episode of Lifestyle Locker Radio. All right, until the next time, peace out.